how do you review something when there's not really anything else quite like it? This is the Hugo M Scaler from Cord Electronics. It is a digital upsampling device. It's unique because there's not really anything else like it. The only real competitor is the DCS Vivaldi upsampler, and that's 20 grand. This is five. It's impressive because of the benefits it brings, and it's slightly controversial because not many people really understand why upsampling can bring a benefit. The common argument is you can't add information that wasn't there to begin with, and that's true. But that's not what upsampling is trying to do. In this video, I'm not going to be explaining exactly how upsampling works, why it's better to do it on something like this rather than just letting your DAC handle it. That's for a separate video. I've got a different video coming where I explain in depth each step in the digital to analog conversion process, and it'll talk about oversampling in depth there. This video is just going to be focusing on the subjective impressions of the M scaler and whether I think it's worth your money to add into your chain. That's all. So let's talk about the build. It's a chord product. If you like the chord aesthetic, it's okay, you're allowed to be wrong. <laughs> if you don't, then th this is what you get. They don't have a plain black box option, y you've got to deal with the, the looks. The build, though, is fantastic. I, I don't like the aesthetics, I don't like this sort of candy ball thing that all the chord stuff has going on, but the actual build is solid. It's all solid metal, it's heavy, it's nice CNC machined, the buttons are tactile and responsive, it feels great. On the front, you've got an array of buttons. These two rightmost ones don't do anything yet, other than if you press them both, you can change the brightness. I've got that low, just so that I don't mind the camera. That one doesn't do anything. It lights up, depending on what sample rate it's currently outputting. That one is to change the output sample rate. Now, as I said, this is an upsampling device. Red is a pass-through. It passes through 44.1, 44.1 out. It's not bit perfect, though. I'll explain that in a sec. Green is a factor of 2, so 44.1 in, 88.2 out. Blue is a factor of 4. And then white, if you're on a chord DAC and you use the dual BNC protocol, which is exclusive to chord DACs, you can't do that on anything else, even something like the May, which has multiple SPDAF inputs, then you can go to 768 kilohertz. If you don't have a chord DAC, technically you can do 384. In reality, though, because no DAC, as far as I'm aware of, has an SPDAF input capable of over 192 kilohertz, 192 kilohertz is the max you're going to get. So that's something to bear in mind, but it's not really that much of a problem. I'll talk a little bit later about how much of a benefit you get using 768 versus just 192 though. So that pass-through, I mentioned that it wasn't bit perfect, and that's because this adds 3 dB of headroom, and the reason it does that is because when you are oversampling, a DAC internally will have this headroom internally. This, because it's digital in, digital out, it can't do that, and it has to add the headroom itself. If you have two digital samples, both of which are at or near full scale level, but the actual reconstructed waveform needs to go above those, so sample here, sample there, the extra samples need to be added in like that, you can't do that, because it's already at full scale, and so as a result, you just get clipping instead. To counter that, this adds 3 dB of headroom, and the reason it does it on the pass-through is so that then when you switch from the pass-through to oversampling, you don't get a sudden change in volume. Both because that would be annoying, and also because if you had it on 44.1 and then switched, this would sound subjectively less impressive, because louder stuff, at least at first, sounds better to us. And so that way you can actually get a fair comparison rather than just relying on adjusting the volume each time. So it's nice that they've done that, to be honest. Video mode. Now, when this is running normally, it adds about a second of delay, and that's because the processing this does does take a while. With music, it's not a problem. You press play, you let the music play, you enjoy it, all good. With a movie or with a game, that's not okay. You have to have stuff happening on screen at the same time as you're hearing it. And so this video mode switches it from the normal filter to a less intensive one, which doesn't sound as good, but doesn't really matter for movies and games, but it has no delay. So it's nice that they've got that, because then you don't have to fumble about with cables, you don't actually have to take this out of your chain physically. Let's have a look at the back. On the back you've got standard DC 15 volt input. I've just been using the stock power supply that came with it. You could, if you wanted to though, add a linear power supply. BNC inputs, optical inputs, USB input, which is what I've been running it on, optical SPDIF output, 
SPDIF over BNC. Now you can use this just as a standard BNC connector, or you can use one of these. This is just an adapter, you can run a normal coax cable, so you can just use a standard coax connection. This was like five quid from AudioQuest, so it doesn't cost much at all. Dual BNC out. Now the only gripe I have here is that I wish these numbers were on the top. The fact that these are on the bottom, the number of times when I've been trying to connect this and having to actually take it out and look or find a picture of the back online. If the dual BNC 1 and 2 was on the top, oh my god, it would be so much easier. Because the problem is you have to have the connection 1 and connection 2 correct, otherwise the dual BNC doesn't work. So the fact that the 1 and 2 is kind of on the bottom is, it's mildly irritating and I wish it was on the top. Other than that, absolutely no qualms. Would have been nice to see something like I2S so that you could use higher sample rates with other DACs, but obviously Cord's got an interest in making sure that you buy their DACs. So, Eh, kind of understandable, still annoying nonetheless. Back to the front. So that's about it for the build. How does it sound with a DAC? How does this improve your listening experience, especially with something like the Dave? The Dave and Chord DACs in general already have quite a lot of work put into their upsampling. Most DACs will use a filter that's a couple hundred, a couple thousand taps at most. Some stuff like the May uses NOS, which is a bit different. I did use this with the May. And I'll talk about the improvements that it made with the May in the May's own video, just because NOS is a bit of a different ball game. So I'm going to be talking about this with oversampling DAX specifically, just regular Delta Sigma stuff. The Dave uses a filter with 164,000 taps. The cutest is, I believe, just over 49,000 taps. Most DAX will be a couple hundred to a couple thousand. This is a million. It's a lot. So talking about the Dave, and here's how I've got it set up. I've got it dual BNC to the Dave. The M scaler itself is being fed by my normal USB source, the SOTM SMS200 Ultra, which is streaming from Rune. Regular BNC out to the Songcos SGD1, and then the Songcos SGD1's coax output to the Modia. So I've got three DACs connected. The SGD1 and the Dave are connected to this XLR switch box, so that I can AB them on the AHP2, and then the Modius is connected to the Magnus at the moment. The Modius is a less resolving DAC, so it's a little bit trickier to actually notice improvements that this makes. It does still make an improvement, but it's not really a fair comparison to something like a Dave, so that's just connected to its own thing. Uh, I've got reviews on all that coming as well, so I'm evaluating that as a stack. Let's talk about the Qtist. In the Qtist review, I mentioned that I like this DAC. It's a great DAC. It's it's nice. I think it's one of the few chord products that's actually priced appropriately. You shouldn't get an M scaler for a Qtist. This is a nice DAC, and this does make an improvement to it, but this isn't a $7,000 combo. For $7,000, you can get a lot more for your money by just buying a better DAC. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be spending money on an M scaler if it's twice the cost of your DAC. The DAC itself will make the biggest upgrade. This and an M scaler doesn't give you a Dave. So yeah, if you have a Qtist or a Hugo 2 or something, I wouldn't recommend buying this. I haven't tried the TT2, apparently this works great with the TT2, but if you have a Dave, that's a different question. The Dave and this together are so good that I wouldn't buy a Dave without it. I mentioned in the Dave review, I like the Dave, it's a fantastic DAC, but I don't think it's worth $10,000 on its own. This is a $15,000 combo, and it's worth it. It's worth every penny, it's fantastic. So don't buy this for cheaper DACs. It's not going to turn a cheaper DAC into an amazing DAC, and it's not going to bring it up to the level of something that you could buy for the same amount. What it's going to do is make an already top-tier DAC even better. That's where this should be sitting. It should be sitting with an already top-tier DAC. So, I'm using the Hi-Fi Man Arias to evaluate this, and that's for a specific reason. The biggest thing that this does is improve staging. Now, stuff like the HD800 is big. It sounds very open, it's got a big sound stage, but it doesn't do intimate stuff very well. These do. These have a really big range of sound stage, and they layer exquisitely. So these are really good for showing off the actual spatial presentation and time domain differences that this improves. This isn't going to make your DAC brighter, it's not going to make your DAC warmer, it's not going to change the tonality of your DAC. It's going to improve time domain performance. Now, time domain performance manifests as stuff like staging, layering, imaging, timbre sometimes. That's where this really improves stuff. It's not going to change the fundamental tonality of your DAC, nor is it going to make your DAC more resolving than it already is. It can improve the overall presentation, which leads to it sounding as if it's more resolving, but a Modius and an M scaler is still not as resolving as an SGD1, for example. 
and an SGD1 and an M scaler isn't as resulting as acutest. It's not going to improve the outright resolution, uh, resolution, but it does improve the overall presentation of your music. So let's talk about staging. Let's use Favorite Sound by Audient. This isn't a particularly audiophile recording or anything, it's not the most impressive recording overall, but it does stage really, really well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to play this at full 768 kilohertz on the Dave, and then I'm going to swap to, once it realizes, halfway through I'm going to swap to 44.1. I can't go from 44.1 to 768 just because the Dave, as you can see, takes a few seconds to realize that it's actually on dual B and C, and it plays in mono for those few seconds, which makes it hard to AB. But it's also easier to realize what's been taken away rather than what's been added, so it's not too much of a big deal. And comparing between, say, 44.1 and 192 is instant, so that's fine. So, 768 kilohertz, favorite sound. Let's do this. There's two things I notice immediately. The first is that the staging just falls in. It's not as big when you have this running at native. The Dave stages well on its own, but this really does just kick things up a notch. Staging is the biggest change that this makes. And that's not just for the Dave, that's for other stuff as well. I'll talk about that in a sec. The staging difference is the difference between something being in your head versus in front of you, in front of you versus across the room, and across the room versus across an arena. It's a big change in staging, and that's the biggest thing that I like about this. The second thing is that separation improves slightly. And I say slightly because chord DACs already do a really good job of this. Chord DACs are pretty immune to jitter because of the pulse array design, which if you want to know more about, have a look at my reviews of either of these. And also because they put a lot of work into their upsampling filters already. The, the separation doesn't improve massively, but it does change a little bit. And to demonstrate that point, let's use Pain. This is a song I've used a few times before, and that's because it's a very busy track, but it sounds different on different DACs. Different DACs are able to separate to varying degrees. The biggest thing that you notice here is that the strings, the guitar that's being strummed on my right, is very distinctly separate when I've got this running in oversampling. And then when I switch it back to native, it's still there and it's still resolving and it's clean, but it's not as easy to pick out. It's not as easy to focus on. I actually have to make an effort to focus on it. Whereas when this is upsampling, it's just there. And I can just, it's like I'm looking at it. It's, it's a subtle change on the Dave, on other DACs, though, it's not a subtle change. If we switch to the song cause and do the same thing... The separation change here is big. The song cause is a good DAC, I like that a lot, I've actually got a review coming on that. This makes a much bigger change to separation with other DACs than it does with chord DACs. That's not because it's doing something special, it's just because chord DACs typically are doing that better already. A Dave alone is gonna make things a lot more separate. In fact, a Cutest even is gonna be a lot more good at separation than a Songkos is. And that's for all the reasons I mentioned before. It's They're really, really good in that regard, so it doesn't change too much if you have a chord DAC. If you have a non-chord DAC, it makes a big difference. The third thing is timbre and speed of attack. Transients are a lot sharper. That's part of what's going into helping me hear the strings a little bit more clearly in this track. Let's pick something else which is a little bit snappier and faster. Let's do... Okay, Blow by Audio Bruce. This is a good song. In the beginning of this, there's a hi-hat. And if I play it on the... Let's stick with the Dave for now, because that's a good deck. If I play it native, and then I'm going to switch to 192 halfway through, and I'm going to see if I can ch notice any differences. The first immediate obvious difference is that the air behind that hi-hat is just so much more present when this is oversampling. The air and the splashiness, it doesn't sound like it's just splashy anymore. It's re 
refined. It feels like you can actually hear the way that the symbols are clattering against each other. It's the subtle details, the low-level stuff that this really, really improves. Those are the big differences. The other thing is the kick drum. The kick drum, when this is running, is... It, well, it sounds a lot more like a kick drum. With it off, it sounds a little bit more like it's just sort of... Well, it's low-end energy, it's punchy, but it's not... The timbre of the kick drum isn't there. That initial snap as the kick drum is hit... I know it's probably a synth in this, but it still changes. That initial snap is a lot faster. It's a lot clearer, it's a lot more refined. It makes the DAC sound faster. It makes it sound like the micro macro dynamics are improving. And everything's all, all the more separate, everything's staged better. The overall presentation just gets kicked up a notch. And again, this happens on non-chord DACs as well. It's not like it's you have to use this with a chord DAC. So let's go back to the song chords and let's do the same thing. So again, the kick drum is so much less refined when I'm not upsampling. It's a lot more clear and convincing in terms of the timbre when this is running. So this makes a huge difference to staging. It makes a big difference to separation if you don't have a chord DAC, or you have a DAC which isn't that great at separation already. With a chord DAC it's less noticeable. Timbre improves quite a bit, and that's not just on stuff like drums. Let's pick something else. Let's pick something a little bit more acoustic. Let's go... Let's go breeze blocks. She may contain me urge, run away, but hold her down with soggy clothes and breeze. So the moss on the toe to toe, the bear has gripped me, but here I go. My heart sings as I come up, yeah, I can find that moss. The vocals and the bass guitar and the drums all sound a lot more convincing when this is running. This is a 96 kilohertz track. So it's not quite the same. You don't get as much of an improvement because it's already a higher sample rate track, but it's still there. And that leads me next on to the point of, if you're not using a chord DAC, if you're getting this to use with a Rock and a Wave Dream or a Terminator or a May or something like that, is the loss of the ability to do 768 kilohertz a big factor? And the answer is no. It gives you about 80% of the improvement if you go to 192 kilohertz and other than that, it's fine. You get all the same improvements, just, just a little bit less. It's still very much worth the money. It's still very much an impressive improvement, even if you're just doing 192. So let's go from 768 kilohertz on the Dave to 192 kilohertz. There's all the same improvements. It's, it's just a touch more closed in, but so subtle, I really wouldn't worry at all if you're planning on getting this for non-chord DAC. It's absolutely fine. 192 kilohertz is really plenty. You've got to keep in mind, with normal music, 44.1, you don't have much space between the audible band and the Nyquist frequency. The audible band is at 20 kilohertz, and the Nyquist frequency is at 22.05. You've got 2.05 kilohertz. When you go to 192, you've got like 37 times more. So it's a big improvement, and going to 768 kilohertz is nice, but it really is very diminishing returns. And I, I have to A-B quite repetitively in order to pick stuff out. It's deceptively... It's a little bit deceptive on this, because, as I mentioned, when you go from 192, say, to 768... It plays in mono for a couple seconds when it's realising that it's not on Dolby and C. And so then when it goes back to stereo, you get this massive increase in soundstage and everything sounds better because it's not mono anymore. But that's obviously not a fair comparison. So it's a little bit tricky to AP. But going from 768 and then switching down quickly to 192, the differences are really subtle. The differences between 44.1 and 192 are not subtle. It's quite a noticeable improvement in staging, timbre, apparent speed 
resolution doesn't change. I've seen a few people say that that makes their DAC sound more resolving. I don't think that's the case. I've tried it on stuff like the Modius, the SGD1 as well. Like, these are all pretty resolving DACs. It doesn't change that much about the outright resolution. It might appear more resolving at first just because the spatial presentation is better, the timbre is a little bit better, and the separation is better, but the actual detail retrieval on, say, the Sonkos SGD1 with this versus a Dave alone, it's still not the same. It's still a big gap, and you still get the resolution of whatever your DAC is capable of. So it's a little bit tricky to pick those differences apart. Don't expect this to make your DAC more resolving, but it does improve other areas. So let's talk a little bit about NOS. I'm going to talk about this more in the May review. NOS is a bit of a different game, because NOS sounds different to oversampling, and different NOS implementations sound different. Stuff like the May uses analog reconstruction. Stuff like Denifrip stacks don't. They literally just output true NOS, I guess you could call it. So this is going to sound different from a Denifrip stack. That with oversampling is going to sound a bit different. It's, it's not really possible to compare because it's different rather than just being outright better or worse. Because you don't have the same time domain issues because you're not oversampling on this. I mean, you can do oversampling. Uh, you can do oversampling, oversample PCM, DSD, run it NOS, whatever. But it's different. You don't have the same time domain improvements with this that you do with an oversampling DAC. So that I'll talk about more in the May review. It does make a difference and it does bring some improvements. But then with the May specifically, I wouldn't get this. And in fact, the reason I wouldn't get this for most setups is because HQ Player exists. Now, HQ Player is a software based player. Rune has integrated support for it. You can literally just add it as an output device like that. So, HQ Player. And it's a software based player and it does much of the same thing as this. It upsamples your audio and outputs it to your DAC. You can use networked endpoints like the uh, SMS 200 Ultra has HQ Player support. An HQ player doesn't have some of the same limitations. It doesn't have a 192 kilohertz limitation. You can go to full 768 kilohertz. In fact, with a May, you can go to 1.536 megahertz. So that's a big advantage to HQ player. HQ player also has different filters. You can select the filter you want to use to sort of tune things slightly. Some DACs have that as well. I mean, some DACs like the, uh, if I actually can get this right, you can change the oversampling filter on the song cause as well. But that's not changing the performance, that's just changing the design of the filter. HQ Player has some very basic filters. It has a filter called Sync L, which is 2 million taps at 768 kHz. And then it also has a filter called Sync M, which is 1 million taps. And it's almost like that M was hinting at something, because the Sync M filter sounds identical to the M scalar. And that kind of caught me off guard a bit, because then you go from thinking, well, this is fantastic, it's making a massive improvement to my DAC, to why would I pay three and a half grand for this when I can get HQ Player for a few hundred and use that? Well, there's a few things to note. One is that HQ Player, you have to have a beefy PC. It's not lightweight. There's a reason that this costs quite a bit and you need, you can't do it on a DAC. It takes a lot of compute power. With an FPGA, you can do specific circuitry to do that, and it's a little bit easier. With a general purpose PC, you need like a GPU and stuff to accelerate it as well. So you need a powerful PC. This is also a good DDC. A digital to digital converter feeds your DAC via SPDF, uh, and it acts as the master clock. With SPDAF, your DAC is not the master clock, the source is. So if you use optical from your PC, it's going to sound worse than USB to your DAC, because USB, your DAC is the master clock. This is really good, though, as a DDC. It's really good as a digital source. So if you don't already have a good digital source, HQ Player might not sound identical to this. If you have a good digital source and you use Sync M, to my ears, it sounds identical. And then some of the other filters sound sometimes a little bit better. HQ Player is getting its own video, because it's really interesting, and I want to talk about that. I use it quite a lot. I like the M scaler a lot. I think it's fantastic. I think it makes a massive improvement to stuff like the Dave. I don't think it's worth buying for a Qtist just because the value proposition is a bit wonky. The Qtist is good, and this makes a nice improvement, but it doesn't turn the Qtist into a $7,000 DAC. It's not going to turn a $500 DAC into a multi kilobuck DAC. And it really does belong with stuff like a Dave, or a TT2, or a May, or other high end DACs. If you don't have a top-of-the-line DAC, then just ignore this for now. But you can still check out HQ Player, because that's a lot cheaper.
So overall, it makes a massive improvement to staging, quite a nice improvement to layering, separation, it depends on your deck, timbre improves quite a bit, and it makes your deck sound faster. It's just an overall upgrade. But it's a really expensive upgrade. And whether or not that's worth it is dependent on your situation, what deck you have, and whether or not you can use HQ Player. A huge thank you to my patrons, especially my Diamond Tier patrons, Ross, Mammal, and King Jun Un. If any of you guys want to talk to me on Discord, you can join at the link in the description. Support me on Patreon. Anything I get from Patreon goes into buying more audio stuff or paying for shipping from viewers who are sending stuff in. And then all of it gets reinvested. Everything I buy is going to get resold. So the more patrons I have, the more stuff I can review. And hopefully the more high-end stuff I can review as well. If you'd like to support me on Patreon, there's a link in the description. If you'd like to just come chat on Discord, there's a link as well. Thank you very much for watching. Leave any questions you have in the comments below, and I will do my best to answer. Have a great day.